Uh, it's uh, probably impolite to correct the president immediately, but um, <laughs> I feel th th that I should point out it has been over 50 years and not almost 50 years. Um, and hearing you introduce me uh, leads me naturally into my opening remarks because it would seem that on occasions such as this, if one has been working for over 50 years professionally and that the career has been diverse and life has been interesting and full of contrast, not to say incident, that I would be able to fill 30, 40 minutes happily and easily. But the problem is, with what? <laughs> Should I talk about my uh, decades with the Royal Shakespeare Company? Should I talk about the 28 of the 37 plays that I have been in? Speak about blank verse and iambic pentameter? Or should I talk about my life as a secondary modern schoolboy and my English teacher who is responsible for all of this? Or how dangerous is a warp core breach? <laughs> or given that I'm sure you're all fairly smart, I could just turn it over to you and say, pick a subject from this assortment of life experiences, and I'll talk about that. The only problem with that is that I am certain that we would spend the rest of the hour that I have here discussing whether mutants really rule <laughs> or why there are no seat belts on the Enterprise. <laughs> I'm right, aren't I? That's what you want to hear. Well, we'll maybe come to that shortly. Um, so why don't I just skip through all that first bit until we get to Hollywood in 1987. <laughs> well, it's true. I, I, um, I am indeed, and I, it gives me real satisfaction to repeat this in this august building. I am a secondary modern school boy, left at 15 and two days old, and qualified for nothing. I never sat an exam. Um, I don't have, of course, a degree, except those that have been given to me. This is not a hint by... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no um, documents that will um, inform you of how well-trained I am or well-educated, nothing at all like that. In 1955, you left a secondary modern school with very modest expectations. Most of my friends went into industry or the pits, I mean coal mining, or prison, quite a lot of them. I went into journalism, which probably amounts to about the same thing. I was found out by the editor of the local paper I was working for, a weekly newspaper, because by then I had been sucked into the world of Amdram. And there was a time during my one year with the newspaper when I was rehearsing with six different companies simultaneously. By the way, if Americanisms pop up from time to time, please be forgiving. I lived there for 17 years, and sometimes I don't quite know how to say things, so you will hear <laughs> the occasional Americanism. So I devised a system whereby I could attend all my amateur dramatic rehearsals, by having people deputize for me at evening uh, events that I was meant to cover as a newspaper reporter. Um, people would go instead of me, or somebody would be there who I could call afterwards and take down some copy, or, and again, here we are, happily in the world of contemporary journalism, I just made it up. <laughs> Until one night, when I was not attending 
a local council meeting, a large mill in the center of town burned down. And the, uh, the deputy editor at the time said, well, we don't have to send anybody because Patrick's right next door in the council chamber. Well, Patrick was in rehearsal, and of course, I was found out. And, and given an ultimatum by the editor, which was, you had better spend your time learning how to become a newspaper reporter or get off my paper. So I packed up my typewriter and left that afternoon, determined to become a professional actor. Um, but how had this begun? Uh, well, as I mentioned already, there was an English teacher. There's always an English teacher <laughs> lurking in the background of almost every classical actor that I know. Somebody who threw a copy of Shakespeare or Johnson or Marlowe in front of them and said, no, 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 this is not a dramatic poem. Don't read it to yourself, read it out loud and put them in a play. I think most of the leading actors that I've encountered who, who have had a classical career have such a person in their background. And mine, Cecil Dorman, in his 90s now, still alive, um, put a copy of The Merchant of Venice in front of me. I'd never seen Shakespeare before, and we read the trial scene. He cast me as Shylock, um, which, I've, because I've just finished playing the role at Stratford in what has become known as the Las Vegas Merchant of Venice, and um, it was the fifth time that I played it, because I count the first time at my secondary modern school to be the first experience of performing Shakespeare and performing Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. So this chap had put me on a stage. Nevertheless, why did that have an impact? Uh, I'm on record now because of my work with Refuge, the domestic violence charity, as having talked about my childhood, which was at times chaotic and frightening. And so, when I first walked onto a stage, brightly lit, and there was a darkened auditorium with a couple of hundred people sitting out there, I felt I was in the safest place I had ever been. As a child, I was 12. Why? Well, the next two hours, were pretty predictable. I was not going to be taken by surprise. The unexpected was unlikely to happen. Coupled with that, I was spending my time pretending to be someone else, not Patrick Stewart, someone I didn't care for especially. And so it provided me with every possible opportunity to escape my background, escape my home life, even escape my school and my friends, and for a couple of hours be not only permitted but actively encouraged to pretend to be someone else. My life is more stable now. I like to think it's less chaotic. And certainly doesn't have the terror aspect that it once had. <coughs> but the security of the stage has never left me. The, um, the allotted time of a performance, two hours, three hours, is still for me the highlight of my day. And the moment, and the moments when I feel most secure, most certain of who I am, most certain of why I'm there, and all of my surroundings. That it seems I can do it passing passably well is a bonus that I never looked for. But given that it's so secure, The curiosity is that I lived as an actor for many years, for decades, um, with a, a severe handicap, which was um, 
a fear of actually experiencing strong emotions. So I learned, which is a great British acting skill, to fake it and to make it look authentic. Murderous rage, fury, even happiness. All these things I learned to fake as an actor until one experience in one of Shakespeare's plays, The Winter's Tale, and the director, the late Ronald Eyre, said to me, this play can only work if we believe that you are such a person. Therefore, I'm telling you that Leontes and all of his horrible impulses lives inside you. And what you must do is show them to us. All of those dark and ugly secrets that we all possess must be on display, have, has to be exposed. And if you take that risk, Ron Lair said, he was also a psychologist and I felt safe with him, he assured me that he would hold my hand and stand at my side, metaphorically, and see that I didn't fall. And I didn't. After that experience, I realized I couldn't fake it anymore. That what I was asked to bring to my acting work had to be authentic, the real thing. And if I could not find these emotions and feelings inside me, then I would have to find some imaginatively creative way of simulating those feelings, but not, believe me, faking it for a moment. Um, this had happened shortly before the bizarre incident of Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, <coughs> I had been, from time to time, visiting the United States, California in particular, holding master classes and workshops, primarily on Shakespeare and Shakespearean performance and acting. And one night, a friend of mine, a professor of English at UCLA, had asked me to illustrate a public lecture he was giving. I think it was called The Changing Face of Comedy in Dramatic Literature. And uh, an actress friend of his and myself, we were to read extracts and signed up for this course of public lectures was a man called Robert Justman, who had been one of the original producers of what I think is now known as classic Trek, i.e. Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and so forth. And at some point during this scholarly evening, he turned to his wife and said, we have found the captain. <laughs> the next... <laughs> I mean, if there were more uh, living proof or a better example of the whole thing about my profession being a lottery and a gamble, that was it. Because the next day, I was summoned to Gene Roddenberry's house to meet Big Bird, as he was known, to talk to him about the new series of Star Trek The Next Generation. And as a result of that meeting, my life was about to change, to be utterly transformed. Not at once because Gene Roddenberry thought I was massively unsuitable to be in his revival of Star Trek The Next Generation. Nevertheless, I had a champion in Robert Justman and eventually a champion in the man who was to become executive producer, Rick Berman. And they continued to mention my name. So much so that I'm told at Paramount a memo went round the studio saying that the name of Patrick Stewart must not be raised again ever in connection <laughs> with Star Trek The Next Generation. Well, it was. And I was cast. Or rather, I was offered the role of the captain of the Enterprise. Now, you must understand 
if you had not been to the Royal Shakespeare Company or watched the occasional classic BBC series, you would have never heard of Patrick Stewart, the actor. Um, some uh, weeks before I was actually offered the role in the series, I had been working at the Young Vic in London, a theatre that I'm returning to in a couple of months' time, I'm delighted to say, in a production of Edward Albee's masterpiece, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And the show was very successful, and we were transferring to the West End. But the leading actress didn't want to go. There were only four of us in the production. So there was a meeting taking place with the producers, and myself and the other two actors, Matthew Marsh and Saskia Reeves, as to who should play the role of Martha. And the producer at one point looked at us sitting around the table and said, well, I don't care who you cast as Martha, but it must be somebody that someone has heard of. That was a harsh judgment on my career, which at that point had been for over 28 years. I went to Los Angeles and was offered the job. The next day I met with my agent who said we need to go over the details of the offer. Um, and at some point during this extraordinary encounter when numbers and figures were put out into the air that were simply impossible to believe, that um, he said to me, and of course, um, you know, six years. And I said, I beg your pardon? He said, well, six years. Everybody who signs on for a drama series in, 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 in the United States, in Hollywood, they sign a six-year contract. And I said, that's impossible. I have too many things to do. I can't commit myself to six years of living here. He said, well, look, the fact is you have nothing to worry about because I, I have to tell you this, the series will be a failure. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, look, everybody in Hollywood knows you cannot revive an iconic series. Everyone thinks it's a crazy idea. It's not going to work. In fact, it's very possible you may not make it through the first season. Um, and on that basis, and conversations I had with a few people that I knew in Hollywood, who all said the same thing. Oh, don't worry about it. Absolutely, not a question. Um, you should come over here, make a bit of money for the first time in your life, get a suntan, meet some girls, <laughs> and um, go home. So I signed the contract. <laughs> Seven years later, I, two o'clock in the morning, I stood on the set at Paramount Pictures and filmed the last scene of the final episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, 178 hours of television. And my life was transformed. Not a corner of it remained untouched by this experience. It might have been calamitous, as it has been for other actors, to become so identified with a series and a role, and at times it has been. Once while campaigning for a film role, a very important film role in a very important film, I finally got in to meet the director and he said to me, after 15 minutes of desultory conversation, look, I have to be frank with you, why would I want Jean-Luc Picard in my movie? Um, and that hurt, but I, I could understand where he was coming from. However, it transformed other aspects of my life in a very positive way in that it made me, so far as the theatre was concerned, suddenly bankable. That is, I could open plays, whether in New York or Los Angeles or London or Washington or wherever. And ironically, having been so afraid of exposing myself to so much television, it opened a multitude of doors, including a return to the Royal Shakespeare Company, no longer as a, you know, jobbing, supporting actor, but as a leading member of the company, simply because my presence put bums on seats 
and really little else other than that. So I have to be grateful for those seven years uh, in that they have transported me to this place where for the last seven years um, I have been able to play role, great role after great role after great role and enjoy myself more as an actor than I have at any time in the 50 odd years of a career. It, um, it was curious to me that that kind of commercial success should have its major benefit back in the classical theatre in England, which is where I have spent the last six or seven years since I returned from 17 years of life in California. What were the benefits of that? That I had been exposed to the public in a way that had been entirely unknown to me before, in a very visible way. It made me feel that I had a, really for the first time, that I had a voice as an artist, as an actor. I'd made the breakthrough before about, about being able to expose myself in terms of the inner workings of the life of an actor, but now, I could communicate who I was by my choice of role, by the places that I chose to work in. Um, I could feel like an artist for the first time in my life, and not just somebody who was making a living. And this was the direct result of all of those years and all of those 178 episodes and four feature films of Star Trek, The Next Generation. So, when people um, ask me, you know, how does it compare that experience, those seven years, with the seven years that I've just spent, I have to say with all honesty that if it were all to end tonight, and that largely what I would be remembered for would be sitting in a large chair saying, engage. <laughs> or <clears throat> make it so, <laughs> um, that would be fine by me because I'm proud of the work that we did. I'm proud of the issues and subjects that we tackled. Uh, some of them for an American television series at that time, quite, quite bold, um, and that <laughs> Uh, moment by moment, and I think you can check this, we got the grammar right of everything that we said. That is, we spoke largely very good English for the primary reason that Jonathan Frakes, who played Commander Riker in the series, his father was an English teacher, and he had warned us that if ever we got any grammar wrong, his father would be on the phone to him complaining about it. So it's been... Um, uh, an, an unexpected and uh, colorful career <clears throat> which created opportunities that I would hardly have looked for. And I include in that, for the second time, um, standing in this room in front of all of you because the, there was a time in my life when had this been suggested to me as a possibility, it would have seemed absurd and grotesque. And for that reason, I am grateful for the time that I spent, every single part of it. If there is only one um, note of slight disappointment with myself as I look back, it is that I was not braver sooner. And when um, in the degree ceremony days at Huddersfield, I have to make the Chancellor's speech every year, there's one part of it that never changes. And I talk about courage. And I quote Winston Churchill. 
um, who said that the greatest virtue is courage because it makes all the other virtues possible. That only with bravery and a determination to celebrate that which is unique in each one of us, in each one of you, that part of you that is not cloned, that is not a carbon copy, but is absolutely identifiably unique. And to celebrate that in how you live and how you work with courage, with bravery, then the chances are that life is going to be interesting. Uh, thank you. You've been lovely. I, I appreciate your invitation, and I've had a jolly afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.